Herman Mashaba said a moment ago, there's a bad ANC and an even worse ANC. Now, you know Cyril Ramaphosa very well. Yeah, we've been friends for many years, yeah. Would you, would you challenge Herman? You know, the problem, um, Alec, is that Cyril Ramaphosa, in my opinion, is a good man, but he's surrounded by hyenas. And it's very hard because the ANC is not just a political party, it's got a culture. And the culture is that you, you don't rock the boat. Now, the only way to clean up the ANC is to rock the boat. But since they have a culture that says you can't rock the boat, then it means the ANC can't get cleaned up. So it's a very difficult number. The only way, in my opinion, the ANC could be worth voting for again is each and every one of these thugs that has stolen money from the taxpayer goes to prison and the ANC starts uh, a process of dealing with them. Look at this hanky-panky with Ace Mahashuli. I mean, no country in the world will put up with that nonsense. They've got, this, uh, they've got people who are in government who are awaiting trial for corruption. Nowhere else in the world do you have that, except in a, um, what do they call it, a police state. You know, there are some countries that are police states. We nearly became a police state under Suma, by the way. We got that close to becoming a police state. Now, at the time, uh, the so-called CR17, uh, it was touch and go. No, we forget that. Okay. We forget that. If Nkusana, uh, what's her name? Dlamini Suma. Yeah. If she had become the president, you know, maybe I would have taken one of my passports and packed my bags and gone because actually we would have been finished. But, but the guy who made Cyril president, you have had, you've crossed swords with him. No, I'm not Abuza. saying he made him, you know. Well, he did, because he switched sides. Yeah, well, yeah, but you know, I think there was a reason for that too. It's all about money at the end of the day. Now, you're talking about Mabuza. Indeed. Uh, Mabuza's rotten to the core. Uh, he's a deputy president waiting, f in my opinion, waiting for prison. Okay. We're talking about a guy that's paid bribes to people through lawyers. You know, there's no shortage of lawyers in South Africa that are happy to use their trust accounts for movement of money to pay bribes, which is a sad indictment on the legal profession. I've named and shamed a lot of lawyers, and there's a lot of them that I still want to see go to prison. And I'm patient. Uh, I've been after certain lawyers for a number of years now. And, you know, God is good. One day, I get an email on my desk from somebody that used to work in a particular law firm who says uh, she was uh, uh, harassed sexually by uh, one of the bosses, uh, and eventually she had to leave, uh, but she's taken certain documents with her, and she wants to come clean on what they were involved in. Wow. It happens. It happened. So we're now working with that person, and my plan is to put the heads of that legal firm behind bars. I've been after them for 15 years. They're going to go to jail. They don't know it yet. That's why I'm not naming them, but they're going to go to jail. That's why these people want to kill me, I don't know, two, three times a year. Uh, we have to live behind high walls with electric fences, and vicious dogs on the inside, and then if they do climb over the wall, obviously, you know, I have to shoot them, but the bottom line is, we have to live like that. Do you shoot people? I mean, would, you, would you do that without any conscience? If somebody climbs over my wall, I will shoot them. Do you then agree with uh, that guns should be uh, more widely available? Uh, let's put it like this. If I didn't have a firearm, I wouldn't be sitting here today, okay? Uh, so they have tried to kill me a number of times. Uh, I've been shot, as I say, when I was in the police, I was shot three times. Um, and I was quite badly injured. And sadly, I had to do the crime scene of one of the cases where I was shot. Because when I came out of hospital, I tried to find out who is the IO, and they said, oh, um, actually, they forgot to open a docket. I I've killed a guy. The guy that shot me, I've killed him. So I've gone back to the place where the shootout took place, and I've had to... Uh, a, a week after the event, 
and do the, do the crime scene. And I mean, that, that, it's a sad indictment. Uh, we got a case recently where one of my staff went into a police station to open a docket. And the cop behind the counter told my staff member, oh, but you've typed out the affidavit. No, that's not allowed. It must be handwritten. <laughs> and she's a lawyer. And she said, no, you, I'm sorry, but with all due respect, you are wrong. And he wouldn't have any of it. He said, well, I'm not allowing you to open that docket. So she phoned me from the police station. I have the telephone number of all the station commanders. You have to have. And I phoned the station commander. I said, do me a favor. Go to your front desk. See what's going on there. Uh, Sarah Jane's there trying to open a docket, and the guy's giving her a run around. And within two or three minutes, you know, the docket was opened. But how on earth did the public deal with that? Yeah. I've heard of public going into a police station that have just been assaulted, and they're dripping blood from their face, and the cops chase them out because they don't want blood on the floor. Paul, that brings us to, to one of the important issues that, that Herman raised about CADA deployment. One of the easiest places to deploy cadres into would be the police force and places like the NPA. You've done a lot of work on this. How deep is the rot and how does it get turned around? Well, I've made the point that the police service was captured. Okay? Now, uh, it started, by the way, with Jackie Celebi. So what Jackie Celebi did was he, you know, when you've got a crooked cop running the police, they all want to have uh, people of a like kind as their close lieutenants. So you end up in a situation, for example, where Richard and Lully, a classic example, uh, and we opened a case against him in 2010, which is what, 11 who, years? Who ago. was he? Richard and Lully was a head of crime intelligence. Now, when I was investigating Jackie Celebi back in 2003, 2004, and uh, Everybody said I was bombing. I said, no, the chief of police is corrupt. They said, oh, you're talking rubbish. I said, no, I'm telling you. And I infiltrated uh, with skills that I picked up many years ago when I was working for the British government. I infiltrated the crime syndicate around Jackie Celebi. And what we found was he was promoting people. As a chief of police, you've got unbelievable powers. He was promoting sergeants to brigadiers or in those days they called them directors, okay? He was promoting people that had absolutely no skills whatsoever, but they were getting promoted because they were loyal to him. That's called a deployment. When you promote somebody because they're loyal, that's called a deployment. It's been going on in the police since after the days of George Fivers. In other words, it started with Jackie Salibi. It hasn't stopped. Well... Having said that, I think it's coming to a, uh, a stop now because it totally now, uh, anybody who moves up more than one rank, he wants, uh, he made a new rule that if you're going to move up more than one rank, he needs to approve it first. So it's put a stop to this situation where somebody's a sergeant one day and a captain or a major or a colonel the next day or a brigadier um, because that's called a deployment. In the National Prosecuting Authority, if you read the Act, the NPA Act, the job of appointing a director of public prosecutions is that responsibility falls on the president. So obviously, Zuma wanted to have people in the right places. You know, if I'm out committing crime, I want to make sure that the police are loyal to me and the prosecution service are loyal to me. So it's never come out in the Sondo Commission for some reason, but uh, Sean Abrahams was headhunted by Michael Hulley, which is uh, Zuma's lawyer, and he was involved in hanky-panky uh, on the Pomozzi, uh, you know, he was the director of the Pomozzi mine, which went into liquidation and all the money vanished. Uh, so Michael Hulley... Uh, with, uh, what was the name of the big fellow? Uh, Kulabusi. Kulabusi uh, Zuma. Uh, and I think there was even one of the uh, Mandelas was involved there. The, you know, uh, the whole thing was a complete mess. Anyway, Michael Hulley phoned Sean Abrahams one day and said, look here, need to have a meeting. 
So they met, and they told him, and Sean Abrahams jumped three, four, four places in seniority. Bang, 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 National Director of Public Prosecutions. And he was appointed by Sumer, but the process was managed by Michael Hulley. And then, of course, you had this woman, uh, Nomkhova Jeba, who was, she'd been fired. The NPA had fired. She was re, they settled. You know, she was suing the NPA because she said she was unlawfully de dismissed. But, but how deep is that? Because when you look in politics, you've yeah. got uh, the former minister of mines, who was a backbencher in the Free State, uh, who suddenly became minister of mines when uh, the current minister, you or mean the previous, Swami? Sorry? Who, which who? Uh, the minister of mines. Name? Forgotten. Okay. <laughs> You you're talking about I'm now, talking about. or uh, it'll come to me in a minute. Back, Swani. No, no, Swani, Swani. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, Swani was appointed for a reason. Now, when you make people a minister because of, of uh, a nefarious agenda, it goes without saying that the Suma cabinet was a nefarious cabinet. There wasn't a decent person amongst them. You had, for example, Natty and Klerko was the uh, minister of Police. Now, when you have a criminal as a Minister of Police, I refer to him, and the present minister, by the way, I refer to them as Minister of Crime, because they're not Ministers of Police. But the, the point, sorry, that I'm, I'm trying to get to is we know this happened in the police force. We know this happened yeah. in Cabinet. It's yeah. pull someone who's loyal, who's a very low uh, operator, make him very senior, he will serve your purposes. Yeah. How deep is it? It's very deep. And how long will it take to get Okay, so what fixed? is like, um, it's a cascading effect. All right. So we had, for example, Natty and Klecko. I'll just give you this quick example. Natty and Klecko was a minister of police. He had a chief of staff called Mbangwa. Mbangwa masqueraded as a person who was born in South Africa, where in fact uh, was a Zimbabwean and used to work for the CIO, which is the intelligence organization in Zimbabwe. And now he suddenly becomes the chief director in a ministry of police. And we found this out, so we pointed it out to them. I managed to, I got somebody in Zimbabwe to go and get uh, his birth certificate. And then in Zimbabwe, there's a process, they use a lot of the British laws, which are still in place. They have a thing called a deed poll. He changed his name by deed poll, which means you literally go into a registrar office and you fill in a whole lot of documents and you swear under oath and you change your name and they advertise it in the newspaper. He changed his name to match the name on the fake ID book that it was issued by Home Affairs. He went to prison for it. He was released from prison and spent the rest of his time in South Africa on a certified copy of a photocopy of his ID book. He's never been issued with a new ID book. He got a diplomatic passport issued in his name. And I mean, it's rotten but, to the core. Again, what I'm trying to get to, Ramaphosa has been president three years. Yeah. How much progress has been made in this three-year period to unravel uh, all of the... Not enough. Okay. But how much? What, what would you say? If, if 100 well, I'll, was I'll give fixed. you an example. If you look at the police, for example, you know, we have a beautiful piece of legislation in South Africa called the Labor Relations Act. Now... Somebody gets appointed into the police, no qualifications, no knowledge about the job they're going to be doing. For example, Ndlule's family, a lot of his family members are captains and colonels in the police that still haven't been put out of the police. Not because their appointment was illegal, but because nobody has got the time or the effort to apply the Labor Relations Act and dismiss them. Because for some reason, Nobody wants to bite the bullet and deal with it. Yeah. Gets back to what you said in the beginning. You don't rock the boat. Are we ready for questions? 
sorry, Graham McIntosh. Thanks, that's a great rah-rah speech. I appreciate that. Um, what interests me is how do you operate, I mean, what's your business called? Uh, and if I, for example, found something or somebody, because you did a great job on South African Airways and with one of Zuma's concubines there, what did, uh, who did one contact? I mean, do we go on to do okay, a Google, so do we Google Paul Sullivan? Uh, we, have a, we, we have a charity called Forensics for Justice. And it's a very simple web address, forensicsforjustice.org. It's there. There's a contact form on there. I don't dish out my own cell phone number for obvious reasons. Um, but there's a contact uh, form on there. And there's a contact telephone number there. We also have a toll-free line, which is 0800 118 118. Um, so, you know, and that is not manned 24 hours a day, but it's available 24 hours a day. And if you phone 0800 118 118 and there's nobody manning it, you can leave a message or you can send a text or there's an email address called info at forensicsforjustice.org. So we well set up for that. Um, I have to tell you, we don't take all the cases that are, that are offered to us for the simple reason that we lack resources. Now, um, I'm a businessman. I have involvement in a number of businesses. Um, my, my main sort of business activity is property. And then I have a forensic company called Paul O'Sullivan and Associates. On the Forensics for Justice side, uh, we get people coming to us with all sorts of things. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, 90% of it, we write back and say, we're sorry, we can't assist you. It doesn't fit our mandate, and our mandate is uh, corruption, which has an effect on uh, the balance sheet of the country. So police, uh, government ministers, you know, that sort of thing. And we've been very successful. We carry out the investigations, we expose it in the public domain, and I'm grateful to Alec because everybody says the media are decent and honest people, they're not. Uh, the media also have their issues to deal with. As is crystal clear, we had a, a massive punch-up with the Sunday Times. Uh, obviously, I had a massive punch-up with the New Age and uh, what's it called, ANN7. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'm really content that things are getting there. No. Bruce? Uh, Bruce Dakers, thank you for an interesting talk. What is your take on Ace Magashula and where do you think it's going to end? Okay, so I've seen the charge sheet um, and I must be brutally honest with you and say that I'm not that satisfied with that charge sheet, okay? And I think there's other stuff that he's been involved in that he should be charged with. So the charge sheet I've seen, um, yeah, I think that, you know, it's like charging somebody for stealing a bag of sweets when they've actually, you can actually see they've robbed a bank, you know. Uh, I think he, there's other stuff he needs to be charged with. Um, and the problem you have with the likes of Ace Magashuli is a bit like Didi Mabuza, you know. These people have stolen so much money that, and that people that want to actually blow the whistle on them, uh, you know, they get concrete uh, boots and found at the bottom of a river or they've been murdered in some way or they just vanish, you know. So unfortunately, Ace Magashuli is without a doubt the personification of corruption and he needs to be behind bars. He doesn't need to be the deputy president of this country which is where he wants to be. Just a question, the Zondo Commission, how influential do you think that will be? The Zondo Commission, how influential do you think that will be to putting people behind bars? Because people are squealing about the fortune it's costing. Um, I'm hoping that they've got enough evidence for those people to slide over to the NPA and then do the dirty on that side. I don't know what your thoughts are. Well, look, you know, I've got my own opinions about the Sondra Commission. Um, there is some good coming out of it, but uh, some of the questions being asked are not, uh, they're not deep enough. I've seen people sitting on the Sondra Commission stand, and the, the questions they've been asked are not penetrating this veil of secrecy uh, which exists. 
And then you get someone like Dudu Maeni, who I opened dockets against back in 2015, which is six years ago, and she's been protected. I'm now in dialogue with a prosecutor and an investigating officer because they've taken all my old dockets and they're looking at them. They're investigating them. And curiously, I had a meeting with the investigating officer last week and um, he told me uh, they're now looking at uh, Patrice Massepi, you know, which I think uh, he's got some questions to answer. He paid 10 million rand to the Jacob Zuma Foundation he gave 60,000 rand to do to Miami personally for the job of introducing him to Jacob Zuma. So um, we have some challenges. Patrice is dynamite. So is I? that in the public domain, that Pat Patrice is... Yeah, some of it's dynamite and it's in the public domain. But, I mean, Duda Miami sits there and I allow her to say, Chairman, may I not answer that question? in case I might incriminate myself. They should have put their foot down. And then she goes and names. I made the point, and I think you published it. She goes and names a witness who had been given witness protection. <clears throat> there were policemen sitting there at the Sondag Commission, and she broke the rules, and she committed an offense, a criminal offense, right there and then. If I was a policeman, I would have arrested her on the spot. And it didn't happen. And I'm left wondering why. She's still being treated as a goddess. And she's nothing of the kind. She's an out-and-out -out criminal. And when they dragged me off the plane in 2016 with my two small children, two of my girls, I have a large Irish family, five girls and two boys. And two of the girls were on the plane with me. And they dragged me off the plane. And then they, they detained me and tortured me for three days. On the second day, I've got my hands cuffed behind my back, and I've got this corruptly appointed general uh, who was totally unfit to be appointed, Mokateri. Mokateri got favor because he tried to protect Zalebi during his trial. And I've got Mokateri poking me in the chest like this. He says, you don't know how you've upset Dudu Mayani. And he said, I'm going to make sure, we're going to charge you with terrorism, we're going to charge you with breaching uh, the Protection of Information Act, you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. And then he, 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 he said something nasty to me, which, you know, you don't do to... I'm not going to repeat the word now, but you don't do that to an Irishman. But I had my hands cuffed behind my back, so I headbutted him. <laughs> and after that, he never came close to me again. And now he's in the departure lounge. He's no longer the head of Hawks for Gauteng because when Godfrey LeBeyer was appointed, I had an urgent meeting with him and I told him, listen, that guy's a criminal and this is what he's done and blah, blah, blah. In, in December 2016, he opened a docket against me for treason. He said that I was conspiring with Robert McBride, the DA, and AFRI Forum to overthrow the country, overthrow the government, which is the biggest lot of poppycock I've ever heard of in my life. And um, the Sondo Commission, they've not drilled down into all that. Mokateri should be at the Sondo Commission. S uh, 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 um, Lucky Montana should be at the Sondo Commission. Um, why isn't Sean Abrahams at the Sondo Commission? These people are running rings around. They need to be there and explain what they've been doing in their lives. What about Marcus Yoster? Who? What's going to happen with Marcus Yoster? I know we have discussed this before, but I'm sure there are many who haven't actually picked that up. Uh, you know, let me tell you how it works over here, Alec. And I'm talking with my experience as a policeman. And by the way, when I was in the UN police, I was also a prosecutor. So I know a little bit about prosecution service as well. The bigger the crime, the less chance you have of being held accountable. Now, I can tell you, a poor woman who's starving to death, who goes into checkers and steals a loaf of bread and gets caught, she'll be in court the next morning. Instant justice. If you steal a billion rand or two billion rand or ten billion rand, you've got money to hire lawyers <clears throat> who are happy to live off the proceeds of crime 
and run rings around the system to keep you out of jail. I mean, he hasn't even been charged yet. And the alleged offenses have been known about for a number of years. So uh, I, I once made the point, if you look at how the construction industry works in China, in China, <clears throat> they can put up a 100-story building in six months. It took us four and a half years to build the Khao train. And yet, a docket that I opened six years ago with prima facie evidence of corruption by Lucky Montana, the CEO of Prasa, nobody has even tried to attach any of the money that he stole, which was hundreds of millions. In fact, somewhere in the region of four billion were swiped out of Prasa. Do, do you think someone like Herman Mashaba, if he became president of this country, would be able to make a difference, or was it just so embedded in the police system that nobody could change it? All right, so I've got a, a, a solution. I wrote a paper, uh, must be about uh, 20 years ago. I presented it to George, more than 20 years ago. I presented George Fibas, and I explained to him how to make the police work more efficiently. And the same can be done with the prosecuting service. And I said, what you do is you have, uh, like they do at SARS, by the way, and, and, and the units at SARS are back again. Uh, but, the, you know, we don't, they're, they're not rogue spy the, units. They're non-rogue units. Yeah, yeah, they were never rogue units, you know. There were never any rogue units at SARS. I worked with them. In fact, I used those people at SARS to take down Radovan Kretja. Now, the solution is very simple and you use the SARS model in the police and the prosecuting authority, which they're starting to do, and that is to have a high rollers unit. You know, in the gambling world, they talk about people who, they call them the high rollers. Well, there's a high rollers unit at SARS, and you believe it or not, they just sit and they go through the NITIS. You know NITIS? It's the National uh, Administration for, for, for Motor Vehicles. Well, anybody can go on to NITIS, well, not anybody, but in SARS, you know. So they've got this high rollers unit there, and they can select, right, give, give me a printout of everybody that's got a Ferrari. Great. Nice system, okay? Because, by the way, um, uh, what's his name? Angelo Agresi was, uh, was declaring 100,000 rand a year income, and he had three Ferraris. That doesn't take rocket science to work out. So if your assets, and by the way, who was it? Uh, Glenn Agliotti. Glenn Agliotti was declaring 50,000 rand a year income, had a fleet of cars, had uh, 15 million rand houses. He was involved in drug trafficking. We penetrated that. We nailed him. It was SARS that helped us nail him. And then, of course, the scorpions. I believe, I think Herman mentioned, are you here, Herman? Yeah. Where is he? Ah, there you are. It's very hard because you've got the light in your face here. Uh, but Herman mentioned that he wants to put the scorpions back. Didn't you say that? Absolutely bang on the button. The scorpions were so effective, they had to be disbanded by Zuma. Because with the scorpions around, Zuma would have gone to prison. He wouldn't have gone to... Last, last question. Why has Ramaphosa not reinstated the scorpions? He doesn't have the balls. Okay? Ramaphosa... Is treading a, let me tell you what will happen. If Ramaphosa decides to do the right thing and nail all these people, <coughs> there will be an NEC meeting and he won't be the president anymore. He'll be gone. Because they are crap scared of what will happen if the, he starts knocking them. If I was in Ramaphosa's shoes, I'd do it anyway. In fact, if he did the right thing, not only would he nail those people, if he got nailed himself, he would sound the death knell for the ANC because they still think they're going to win the next elections. Paul O'Sullivan, thank you for being with us. Thank you for... Thanks a lot.